Okay, we are in our series on the church, the mystery of the church, and it's not going to be much of a mystery by the time we're done with this. That's the whole point. Uh, tonight we are going to be talking about the purpose. And I'm not going to be able to complete this one point, the purpose of the church tonight, but we'll get to a certain point and we'll stop and we'll pick it up next week. This... Um, <clears throat> As I've said about Sunday evening services right now, particularly, well, really, in this series here on the church, it's very, it's, it, in my mind, it's more teachy, um, it's, it's more classroomy, you know, if you will. Uh, so, and, so I need, look, but, but I want to challenge you to just, look, listen on purpose, listen on purpose and, and get it, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm not going to... Uh, you know, like uh, like I do in some sermons, not going to be real motivational. Uh, just gonna just gonna list the points, list the scripture, read it, brief comments, moving on to the next points. Uh, especially under uh, point number five here, the purpose of the church, and that's the way it's going to be this week and next week for sure. But I need you to though understand if I could really impress upon you tonight to. To get under the, uh, uh, to feel, to feel the responsibility that God has laid upon the church. Who's the church? We are, we are right? It's not these buildings. So that means if, if and all believers make up the body of Christ. Now for that local assembly, we are that local assembly. And we, we, we can't just, and every member of this church needs to get under the burden of what is it that God's, what is God's purpose? What is He, you know, what's He trying to do with the church? And, 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 and it's everybody's responsibility. Everybody's. So uh, just keep that in mind. All right, we're going to review now uh, just for a couple minutes here. Number one, the... I've already said it. I've already said the definition. But the called out assembly. What is the Greek word that means a called out assembly? Ecclesia. Everybody got that? Everybody say it with me. Ready? Ecclesia. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. Ecclesia. Called out assembly. And uh, see, now, now you can tell people, I know Greek. I can speak Greek. And all you have to do is say, Ecclesia. I thought it was a little funnier than that, but are you tired? You tired tonight, <laughs> this afternoon? All right. Was church God's idea or man's idea? God's idea. And if it's God's idea, that means that, that God designed it. God thought it up. God didn't just say, as we talked before, He didn't just say, I want you to gather, and, uh, and, and, you know, but y'all figure that out. No, God says I have a design for the church, and we're we're going to get into it tonight, and going to give you a bunch of different points tonight um, for the for the purpose. But it's God's idea, and if it's God's idea, then it has to be important. It has to be important. We are going to do things. Look, to the best of my ability as your pastor, we're going to do things according to Scripture. Okay, and uh, and 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 we're going to make sure that Scripture bears out the things that we say it does. We're not going to say that we believe this and, and, and not have some principle in the Scripture that backs it up. Um, so, so church has got to be, I'm trying to convince us all, and again, as I often say, I'm, I'm talking to the choir. I know that. You're here. And many of you will be back on Wednesday, but, but nevertheless. Uh, next. The Trinity is fully invested. God the Father, okay, God the Father, God the, and God the Holy Spirit. And they are fully invested. Don't think for a moment, well, the church is that thing that Jesus started. No. Remember, God planned it. Jesus executed it on the cross. And the Holy Spirit empowers it. Sally got it. She, she mouthed it up here. God, God planned it, Jesus executed it, and the Holy Spirit empowers it. And listen, we've got to understand this. This 
is what God is doing in this world. It's what God is doing. It always has been what God is doing. The first reference to a Savior, does anybody know the reference in the book of Genesis? The very first reference to a Savior. Genesis 3.15? Do you say what you said, Mom? Yeah, I think so. Genesis 3.15, there's a promise of a Savior. From that time, from the time that the first sin was committed, God has been totally about winning man, drawing him back to himself. That's all he's doing. And everything that you see in the world today is what he is doing. God, look, God... You know, God doesn't have two or three things of equal value that I'm doing. No, God is doing one thing. That's winning people back to Himself. That is His great work in this world. And we have got to And that work is going to be accomplished in this day and time through the local church. We have got to believe that. As I said this morning, I, I think... I think it was Sunday school. Sometimes I forget where I say things, but pretty sure it was Sunday school with the couples. Uh, we, we've got to get out of this notion that God is not a genie. He's not a genie. God is not all about making you happy. Now, if you will follow God, if we will follow God and commit to His leading and commit to His plan and design for our lives, we will be the happiest. Uh, uh, that's, the, that's the greatest sense of deep down joy and fulfillment and meaning is by doing and fulfilling the plan of God for your life. Everything else is a, is a poor excuse for happiness that we would find in the world. But... God's not like waking up, or you're not waking up every day and God's saying, okay, what do you want me to do for you today that will make you happy? That's not what God is doing. God is, is working in your and my life every day to conform us to the image of His Son. Period. Why? So that, we, so that His Son can live through us. Why? So that God can reveal Himself to the world. Why? So that He can win the world back to Himself. Now, unfortunately, many will take the broad way. Many are going to reject. It's, God's already said it, and we see it. But, but I will tell you this. There are more saved people out there than what you know of. I've run into a lot of folks that out there that when I just began a witness to them, that they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm a believer. And now, you know, hey, I'm a believer. I'm like, well, is that as in Jesus Christ or are you like a monkeys fan? Remember the old, remember the old, how many people remember the old monkeys? Yeah, you know that song. Uh, I'm a believer. I question that. Or I'm a Christian. I question that. I don't just, I, are you a Christian? Yes. Okay, good for you. No, we don't know what that means and they sometimes don't know what it means. Okay, anyway. Spent more time there than what I intended. Uh, next, uh, beginning with the call of the disciples, uh, the church. When did it have its beginning? Remember, when it called the disciples. Jesus called them out of the world and to Himself. And remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Bible says that 3,000 people were saved on the day of Pentecost, it said that 3,000 people were added to the church. In the mind of God, the church was already there. It was already established. How? And we looked at the Scripture. Through when he called the disciples out, they were the first called out assembly, and uh, so anyway. And these are things that it's a, it's a, an overview, but things that we need to we need to pull away from this moving forward. And then a church is uh, can be a, a universal body or the local assembly, depending on the uses. And we looked at that in scripture also. Sometimes God refers to the body of Christ, and that's everybody. That's everybody worldwide. And then sometimes He actually speaks of the local assembly, which is like what we see here tonight. Okay. And I'll reiterate here, uh, I, I think that most of God's children do not fully comprehend the enormity 
of responsibility God has put upon the church. And you are the church. And I am the church. And we have a great responsibility, and we're going to dive into that with the purpose of the church tonight. John 12, 48 says this, He that rejecteth me, this is Jesus speaking, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, I have a feeling here that this is mainly speaking to unsaved people, uh, he that rejecteth Jesus and receiveth not the words of Jesus. But I will tell you this, there's also an application of that to us. When we get to heaven one day, we're going to be judged according to the Word of God. Okay? And, and you know, I, I, I don't like to do a lot of negative, you know, this is what's going to happen if you don't type of stuff. I'm, I do it, but I don't like it. It's not my... You know, it's not the way I'd prefer to always do it. But okay, but we'll see it in the Scripture anyway. God is going to judge us according to the Scriptures. And if you say, well, you know, I don't buy into creation. Well, then you can't buy into any of the Bible. You can't pick and choose. We can't pick and choose what parts we're going to believe in. And I just don't believe that a whale... You know, that a whale, uh, great fish, I think it's great fish uh, in the Old Testament, but Jesus called it a whale in the New Testament. I just don't know if I can buy that. Well, then you can't buy any of it. And when we talk about look, every sermon that's preached and every, and every truth that you hear, you now are responsible. <laughs> you know, those of us in college, we... We would joke with each other, and on Mondays they'd be talking about the Sunday night sermon, and, and maybe, you know, maybe we worked, maybe we worked Damien through the Sunday night sermon, or whatever the case is, and they'd be talking about it on Monday, and I'd say, hey, ho, ho, I don't want to hear that, because I don't, I don't want to be responsible for having known that truth. It was just kind of a joke, yeah, kind of, but no, we're going to be judged according to the Word, because that's what God gave to us. Anyhow. Tonight we're going to begin uh, what's going to take maybe two to three weeks to complete, but this one, one point, the purpose of the church. Point number one, under point number five. Point number five, the purpose of the church, point number one, under that. Ready? It is to evangelize the world. Now, how many people knew that? How many people would say, oh yeah, sure, I knew that. Is that all? Okay, yeah. Did anybody back there, did y'all know that to evangelize? Okay, very good. Evangelize the world. Most of you know that. Most of us say, yeah, sure, I, I get that. The church is what carries the gospel and sends the gospel out around the world, and, and, uh, and, and we get the, the gospel to our communities. Okay, fair enough. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Acts 1, 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We, the church, is to evangelize the world. We are to take the gospel, beginning right here in our Jerusalem, and as much as we can, to send it everywhere that we can send it around the world. Uh, Louis Browning was in Chile for 40 years. Forty years, folks. Forty years. Think, think about that for a minute. Forty years now in taking the gospel, helping to do his part to take the gospel around the world. That's our job. That's our responsibility. And that's an easy one for us. A missionary named Dr. Winfield, Win, Winfred, I'm sorry, Winfred Grenfield. That's hard to say. Winf, Winfred Grenfield, a medical missionary to Labrador, was a guest at a dinner in London with a number of socially prominent business or British men and women. Not my kind of crowd. Socially prominent British men and women. During the course of the dinner, a woman said to him, Is it true, Dr. Grenfell, that you are a missionary? His response, Dr. Grenfell says, Is it true, madam, that you are not? That's a good point. That's a good point. We're all missionaries. Um, Dr. Minton, Ron Minton last week, 
The only thing I think this is true, the only thing that I remember him choking up about as he spoke in our Sunday school class or in here when, when he said that it is our job to reach this area right here just as it is his job to reach the people in U U Ukraine. You remember when he stood right there, he kind of choked up on that. I love that. I, I love that. That's a man that, that's a man that see, you know, has, has the God-sized view. And uh, evangelize the world. Absolutely. That's our job. And we should all play a part in our giving. I don't know how many uh, of you that give uh, you know, uh, offerings, uh, special offerings every week to missions. I recommend it. God will do nothing but bless you. And, uh, and you should. If you say, well, I only got like five extra dollars, then give it to missions. And maybe next time you'll have a little bit more. Sometimes the reason why we don't have money is because we don't give money. And uh, anyway, but I recommend that. Evangelize the Word. Okay, that's point number one under the purpose of the church. Point number two. Purpose number two is to glorify God. How many would say, well, sure, I get that. Right. Again, most of us. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church of Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 2 Thessalonians 1, 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him according to the grace of God, of our God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray tell me, if we don't glorify God, it is the responsibility of the church to evangelize the world and to glorify God. How is that done? It's done through every single member of our church. It, in, in its, in its, in, in the, in its um, most powerful way in Clover Hill Baptist Church, every member of the church will glorify God with their life. Now we're going to go over several here points on how to accomplish, how to glorify God. And we're going to pull out scriptures here to show you. Uh, but to speak, all right, listen, to speak of your favorite uh, sports team is to sort of glorify that between, between sports-minded people. Uh, Michael and I may be talking, and I'm a Packer fan, and he's a Cowboy fan, if I remember that right, okay? And if we're talking and we're kind of debating, we're trying to... We're trying to lift our team up over that team, over his team. I'll do that, and he'll try to lift up the Cowboys over the Packers. We might talk about hobbies, and what's your favorite hobby? Well, I don't know. Uh, who has a hobby? Dickie, do you got a hobby? Just doing whatever Sylvia says? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's good. That's a good hobby to have. <laughs> uh, Who's got a hobby in here? Fishing. fishing. There you go. Fishing. That's right. I should have known that. Okay, so fishing. So Michael and I might be talking about fishing. I really enjoy fishing. Ronnie really enjoys I should have thought of that too. Really enjoys fishing. And uh, I like to golf. Now, I like to fish too, but let's just say I didn't like to fish, and I just like to golf. Well, we might talk about that and try to convince the other person that, my, no, my, my hobby's better though. We could, you know... That, that, that is, we, we're lifting up our hobbies, our favorite teams, our likes and things like that in life to, to glorify them, if you will, to convince other people that, no, this is what you should be doing. This is who you should like. Now, that's a real crude type of example, but God expects us to lift Him up, to glorify Him, to give Him the platform, I like to think of, to, to step off of the platform and let God have the lights you know, and, and just say, I'm going to get out of your way. I just, just, I just want to get out of your way, God, and you do it. You control it. Uh, you make it happen. And, and get out, get ourselves out of the way of God. Glorifying people, or, or God points people to God. Anyhow, here are several things under that, how to, how to glorify God. Number one, in our fruit bearing. John 15, 8, herein is my Father glorified. Herein is my Father glorified. This is a way to glorify the Father, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. In our fruit bearing. There's obviously a, 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 a command in there that we should be bearing fruit. Next, in our giving. 
Hebrews 13, 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Giving not only pleases God, it glorifies God. Number three, loving and loving one another. Romans 15, 5 and 6. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And loving, how shall people know that you are my disciples? Jesus said, right, that ye have what? Love one for another. Now get that and understand that. He says the world's not going to be this way. But, but you, you can glorify me by loving each other. And not just loving them that love you. That's the easy thing to do. And the world does that too. But loving even those that hate you. That's hard. <laughs> right? That's hard. That really rubs us the wrong way. And that's really to turn around, hard to turn around on and let it rub us the right way. That's difficult. But, uh, but, but Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, said that's, that's where your greatest rewards come from when you do, when you allow God to empower you to do the supernatural thing, which is to love and pray for those people that hate you and want to destroy you. And that's a tough thing. But nevertheless, that glorifies God. Next. Preaching and ministry, 1 Peter 4.11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When we preach the Word of God, when we minister the Word of God, every time that somebody opens a Bible and teaches that Word of God, Sally, when you do this morning, when you did this morning, you glorified God by, by ministering His Word to other people, by preaching His Word to other people. And any time that we share the Word of God with somebody, every single one of us in here can glorify God. All of us are preachers. Some just do it full time and some don't. But you can glorify God every time you talk about the Scriptures and clear them up and, and minister uh, the Word of God to other people. Next, ways to glorify God, acknowledging Jesus. Philippians 2, 9-11, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, and given Him a name which is above every name. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of, of things in the earth, and things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every time that you acknowledge Jesus Christ as, as the Son of God, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you are glorifying your heavenly Father. When is the last time that you spoke in public with other people about, uh, about Jesus, about the greatness, about your best friend, Next, faith in God's Word glorifies God. Romans 4.20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Faith in God's Word. Next, suffering. 1 Peter 4.15-16, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. How about that? Think, of, think for a minute. Okay. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer. Evildoer. Not a sinner. That doesn't mean sinner. That means doing evil to other people. That's different. That's a different level there. It's, 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 it's one level to do something that hurts yourself. It's one level to break the law of God in some way that doesn't harm somebody else. It's quite, and that's not right either. We are to be clean, right, as we talked about this morning. God wants a clean temple. But to be an evildoer means that I'm going to think of some way to hurt you. I want to hurt you. Murderers, thieves, evildoers, and look who's lumped in with that. Or busybody. When's the last time you used the word busybody? 
Damien, have you ever used the word busybody? <laughs> Not exactly one of our, you know, contemporary words. But as a busybody in other men's matters. You know, where the Bible says, you know, you don't, you don't pull, what, what does it say? When a sleeping dog, you don't pull on his ears or something. Let a sleeping dog alone. Stand of other people's business. <laughs> Amen. Lewis, you kind of, I need to tell you this, you kind of took over Brother Abe's place with me. When I get an amen out of Lewis, I'm really encouraged. I know I'm on the right track. When Lewis is silent for too long, I start to get a little nervous up here. <laughs> amen. Um, no, really. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matter. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. In other words, God, what he's saying, what, what, what God's telling us here is when you suffer because you're a murderer and a thief and you're just getting in everybody's business and you suffer for it, that's on you. You did that. But when you suffer... For Christ's sake, now you're in. Now, now you remind me of my son. And he says, when you do that, do not be ashamed, but yet suffer uh, uh, righteously. It doesn't say that, but it's what it means. Suffer as, as Jesus would. And this glorifies God. All right, next, praise and prayer. Another way to glorify God. Um, Psalm 50, verse 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Praise and prayer uh, glorifies God. All right, next, number, number three, all right? The purpose of the church. Let me just make sure you got your notes right. Number one is to evangelize the world. Number two, purpose is to glorify God. Purpose number three is to edify believers. Now, what does the word edify mean? It means build up. It's build up people. All right, edify believers. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, we've, uh, I think we read, no, that was First Peter. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Read it again. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When we, when we, when we edify people, this brings glory to God also. And understand this, why does it, and it's not really part of our point here, but why do we edify? Why do we build up for the perfecting of the saints? For the work of the ministry. Too many people sit in church and we are the Dead Sea. We just take in and take. See, the Dead Sea has no outlet. That's what I've been told. I've read about. It has no outlet. It just takes in and takes in and takes in and takes in. The productive Christian takes in and gives out. Takes in and gives out. We have people in this church that, that know the scriptures, but just, um, but just you know, don't, don't, don't stand up. Don't, don't stand up to say and share that and give back and, and take in and give out. Take in and give out. The process of sanctification began in the church and is completed through the church. Never met anyone that was a disciple of Jesus that was not joined at the hip with the church. Never met anyone that was a true disciple, productive Christian, um, that was not joined at the hip with the church. Uh, all the people that will tell you, I do church my own way, you do your, I don't like organized religion, we talked about all that in the earlier, uh, earlier in the series. Mostly that's just a smoke screen for why they don't go to church. And they, and they, look, not judging people, but I've never met one that didn't go to church that was productive in the service of the Lord. Never one. And uh, so these things go together. All right, so to edify believers, point number four, 
under the purpose of the church, and we'll stop with this one tonight. Purpose number four is to care for one another in times of need. <laughs> James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I use a lot of emphasis there because we're good at this one. Generally speaking, we're good at this one. We're good at, at, at uh, us four and no more. And what do you, you need prayer? You need help? I'll help you. I need prayer. I need, you'll help me. And us four and no more. We're not, we're not uh, churches as a whole. We're not super great at a lot of these other things. But we're really good at this one. Sharing our burdens with each other. And, and, and look, and I'm for that. Please don't. No, I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying that we're really good. And it's good. It's good that we're good at that. I mean, that's a good thing. But these others we can't leave behind either. We can't leave behind either. Caring for one another, though, in time of need, yes. That's part of, that's part of a family, is it not? Say Amen. Okay, it's part of a family. Families do that. Families should do that. If churches and families did their job, you wouldn't need government handouts. Wouldn't need them. There was a time, some of you remembered, remember that when somebody fell on hard times, it was their family that picked them up. It was the church that, that extended the helping hand. We didn't need the government, but... but but it has gone the way that all things that man gets his hands on go. Man ruins his at ruin. He ruins his. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> man ruins everything he gets his hands on. Everything. It's called the depravity of man. It's just in us. They ruined the Garden of Eden. We've ruined, a good, we've ruined a great country. We have. Now, I know not you and me, but we, we have, man. We've ruined a great country. Greatest country. We've ruined it. Because that's what we do. That's what we're good at. We're really good at ruining things. How come there's no church at Ephesus anymore? Where's the great church that was one time the largest church in the world... That Paul started, where is it now? You think it's an operation? No, you know why? Because man ruins everything that he gets his hands on eventually. There'll be if, if Jesus tarries, there will come a time that just church right here, either the doors won't be open or it won't be fit to attend. You know why? Because man ruins everything he gets his hands on. I'm not saying you and me. You're here. I'm here. We're begging God to keep this thing moving, right? Do, trying to care for our responsibilities to get the gospel out to our neighborhoods and do the best that we can and, 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 and love one another and pray for one another. Bear fruit. Trying to do these things that God honors and that glorifies God and God's blesses. So I'm not, I'm not talking about us, but there'll come a time. It's happened across the board throughout history. Great countries that ruled the world went down. Great churches that were mega churches and wonderful uh, 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 Christ honor. And I'm talking about real churches now. I'm not just talking about numbers. Somebody that can gather 10,000 people on a Sunday and not preach the gospel. Talking about true churches. But eventually, man just, it's what he does. And, Lord Terry's, we, we want to stave that off here. We want to stay true to the Word of God. We want to stay serving. We want to be a church that glorifies God. And that's what we're talking about. Purpose number four, to care for one another in time of need. Okay. We're going to pick this up next week and probably finish that point, the purpose of the church. Again, this is a lot like, uh, cla it's a lot like classroom stuff. Um, I know it's not, it's not preachy as much as it is teachy, 
Uh, but please, but please understand what the church... It, let's, let's take to heart what God has, has revealed to us in His Word about the purpose of the church and how great the church is. The very thing that Jesus shed His what for? Blood. It's for the church. And that's us. Let's pray. Father, please bless us now. Help us all. And we're all prone to... Get a little selfish at times. We're all prone to get a little discouraged at times. We're all prone to um, to get slack in our in our duties and our responsibilities as the church, not to the church, because we are the church. As the church, God help us to uh, play our role and reveal to us our roles and reveal to us areas in which uh, we need to step up and do more. And help us to be the church that you would be pleased, with which you would be pleased, and, and that you would bless, and that you would keep alive and, uh, and build here in Chesterfield County. We love you. Thank you for these people that are here tonight, for their faithfulness to be back, for their love for you. That's why they're here, because they love you, Jesus. I'm convinced of that. Bless them for that. I know you're pleased. And uh, give them a wonderful week of, uh, of service. When, when the times present themselves, may we, may we witness. And it may be just a couple words, or it might be a tract, or it might be a full-out conversation. Helps to take advantage of, the, of them. As the church, revealing to this area, to this neighborhood, to this community, Father, you, and their need of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.